Welcome to the digital entertainment and media stage. My name is Brechtje de Leij. I'll be your host and also moderator for the talks um, on this stage today and also in the upcoming days. Yes, sit all in the front. You also, yes, join us. Thank you very much. Uh, so media, media is basically storytelling and it's something, it's come a long way from going to the village square and listening to travelers who go places we can never visit. Uh, rise of mass media, TV, internet really put storytelling to a next level, but the basics are still the same. We're human beings, we're curious, we love news, we love to be entertained, and who knows more about media than Ricky? Thank you. <laughs> Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, no, I'll no, no, I'm going to, I'm going to. Okay, all right. You are the co-founder of College Humor, a really large comedy brand. You actually pushed it to be the largest comedy brand on the web. True. Most followed YouTube channel yep. for comedy, so that's really impressive. Thanks. But we also know you from Vimeo, video uh, 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 sharing platform. Yep. So you've got an interesting background. Yeah. And you will talk about media and where it uh, goes next. And I wrote, so, um, of course, I looked you up, and you said uh, that you think Mark Zuckerberg is the most powerful person who has ever lived. <laughs> well, that was like a, it was an essay about like. Uh, debates. I, did, I, I didn't like <laughs> say that. I was like, that's something that could be debated because fa Facebook is so big and it so, is. so prevalent. Yeah. And also that the internet kind of sucks right now. So this will not be the topic of today, <laughs> but I <laughs> think we're today. up for an yeah. interesting session. Yeah. Um, Ricky, the stage is Thank all yours. Thank you. All right. Thanks for coming. Um, so um, the title of the presentation I'm going to give today is called Seven Questions for Media in the Platform Age. But yeah, first, uh, some context on me. Um, uh, yeah, College Humor, Vimeo, um, uh, we started an apparel company called Busted Tees, basically to like sell our own stuff online. Um, and after that, we basically took the College Humor brand and expanded it into books and TV and movies. Um, so in terms of like, di like digital media history, I've, I've kind of been around since uh, the beginning. But at no time over this period have I seen more change than what's happening right now in what I call uh, the platform age. So uh, what is the platform age? Well, I think this, this chart from Now This News basically sums it up, right? I in the 1990s, internet traffic was all direct. You would go to like yahoo.com and you would just see what was there. You would just like type in URLs and go. Uh, in the 2000s, we saw the emergence of, of the search phase of the internet where uh, sites like the Huffington Post w rose up and and it was all about getting traffic from Google. Uh, around 2010, we, s we started seeing the referral age, where people would try to get traffic from Facebook, from Twitter, from Pinterest, to their own properties. Um, but now we're in the platform age where it's all about distributed consumption. Consumption happens on those platforms that previously sent traffic to other sites. So what caused this, um, this change? What caused this, this change to the platform age? Well. I think this can best be summed up by uh, Ben Thompson's aggregation theory. This looks very complicated, but it's actually uh, very simple. Uh, ben Thompson runs this site called Stratechery. He's, he's a very sharp thinker in this space. Um, so in media, distribution used to be the hardest part to solve. Like, for example, you had newspapers that had to be printed and then had to be put on trucks and they had to be delivered before y you woke up in the morning. Um, but with the internet, the internet solved distribution. Now anybody could get their content out to anybody else. Um, the after that happened, the tough, the more tough part to solve was discovery. Right? There was so much out there that it was hard to know exactly what each person should consume, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where aggregators came in, like Facebook, like Twitter, like Pinterest, aka the platforms. Uh, Amazon did this for physical products. Uber did this for cars. Uh, basically like turning into the platform age. So what effect does a platform age have on content is the second question. Uh, well, a few things. Uh, for one, content itself changes to fit, uh, to fit the platform. So never has it been more true uh, that content needs to be made specifically for the medium that it's going to live on. So we can look at how, the how content has changed over those four eras that I highlighted earlier. In the direct era, it could also be called like the repurposing era. Like it used to be that it was good enough just to take a TV clip and put it on the web, or take an article from uh, a newspaper and just and just copy and paste it and put it online, um, and that was good enough. Uh, but that's 
that's no longer, uh, obviously will no longer do the trick. Uh, the search era was all about having the right words in your article, and, and Huffington Post definitely owned this. Uh, that's why you would see things, articles called like, what time does the Super Bowl start? Because everybody was searching for what time the Super Bowl started. Um, in the referral era, it was all about getting clicks from uh, uh, social platforms to your platform. So to do that, you had to have like crazy thumbnails and crazy headlines and really like get people to go. Um, there was uh, something emerged called the curiosity gap where publishers would, would leave, uh, like every, every headline was like a question that had to be answered. And the only way you could see the answer was by clicking through. I'm sure you've just seen that over the past few years in your feed. Um, but now in the, in the platform era, it's less about the packaging of the content and more about the content itself. Um, on Facebook or Instagram, the content needs to get people to stop scrolling and actually watch it and engage with it. Um, that means having the right text or captions if the user doesn't have the volume on while they're scrolling. Uh, it also means grabbing their attention right away without wasting their time with like intro credits or, or any stuff up front. Um, one example of this, when Facebook released autoplay, this was like mid-2014, right around uh, the Ice Bucket Challenge, uh, people started putting their videos natively on Facebook. And a movie studio put their trailer up, and what they found was that when they, this green band only lasted two seconds. They put it up with the green band as, as normal, and they said, well, what if we take it off? They took it off, and their views went up by a factor of four. That's how, that's how little patience people have to sit through stuff uh, when they're scrolling. Uh, on Snapchat, the user behavior that you have to optimize for is a little different. Um, users want to be in control of the pacing of the content, and they just skip ahead when they get bored. So that way, that means you need to front load every Snap story with the best part up front to keep them engaged for as much of it uh, as you can to, to keep people watching. Facebook Live video is interesting to look at, and it actually requires a, a somewhat different approach than regular Facebook video. Um, if you look at the first Facebook Live video that got attention, at least it, it did got a lot of attention in the US, uh, with when BuzzFeed put rubber bands on a watermelon one at a time until the watermelon exploded. Um, and this was basically, if you think about it, it's like reverse engineered for, for live video. Uh, tension built throughout. There was a foreseeable end that you were waiting for and, and you didn't want to leave. Uh, you wanted to stick around and see what happened. So another effect that the platform age has on content is that subject matter and topics become, uh, the topics covered become homogenized. Um, this is a tool called CrowdTangle, and every publisher that you read uses it. Uh, basically what CrowdTangle does is it monitors the Facebook pages of every other publisher, and it sees when another publisher posts something that is getting, that is overperforming relative to the other posts. So the effect that this has had is that when a publisher has a story that is overperforming, every other publisher out there gets a notification, and they just rewrite the story. So that's why you'll see the same subject covered instantly uh, by everybody else. Um, and yeah, that's crowd tangle. Um, so another effect of the platform age is that uh, opinionated content beats neutral content. Um, platforms are mostly driven by people sharing, and people share content that can express an opinion for them. Like, content has kind of become the new bumper sticker. And you put it on your Facebook wall, it's the same thing as putting a bumper sticker on your car. Uh, since opinionated content does better than neutral content, naturally more of it gets made and more of it gets seen. And since people are usually friends with people that they already agree with, this kind of creates echo chambers uh, among, among groups. In the US, we're seeing this this year with the election. Uh, people who like Bernie Sanders post to each other, and people like Donald Trump post to each other, and it's very hard for new viewpoints to, f to infiltrate uh, those, uh, those bubbles. Um, another effect of the platform age is that the news cycle has become predictable. Uh, right now, there are more news outlets uh, than there is news, especially, especially more digital news outlets than there is news. So any dumb controversy or new novelty product will always get written about. So a lot of people call this the outrage cycle. Uh, to illustrate this, I've, I've come up with an example that's, that may sound absurd, but given the kind of stuff you've seen over the past year, uh, it might not be that absurd. I call it 
the burnt toast uh, digital media cycle. So here's the example. One morning, a writer at a blog wakes up and burns his toast. After that, he searches Twitter to see if anybody else has burnt their toast. And if you search something on Twitter, you're going to find it because everything has happened to everybody and they've tweeted about it. <laughs> After that, he says, okay, I saw a few people who burnt their toast. Now I'm going to write a blog post on a small blog, let's say Gothamist. After that, BuzzFeed notices that it's overperforming on Gothamist using a, a tool like CrowdTangle. And, and they write up something called 19 Ro Reasons Toast Sucks. From that, the, the headline is A-B tested. The most scandalous headline always wins. So it's here's why everyone is absolutely freaking out about toast. From that, it gets picked up on Reddit, Dig, and it goes to the top. And at that point, once it reaches those sites, every other site has it, and they all have their own special take on it. From that, mainstream media picks up this, this toast outrage, uh, and everyone starts talking about it. It goes to so social, has hashtag toast sucks. It becomes a Facebook trending topic. And then a celebrity will probably say something dumb about it. After that, uh, the celebrity will, will probably apologize for saying something dumb. Uh, then it gets covered on TV, because TV can just report on the outrage, doesn't have to actually say it's an outrage. And uh, it's a national news story, all because of three tweets. So that's, that's kind of how these things happen in the, in the, the platform age. When you see a, a TV cover something, and you're like, wow, this is so idiotic, how did this happen? That's exactly how it happens. So uh, what does the platform age mean for media companies? Well, taking a step back, I think the larger reality for media companies is that they're no longer competing against each other, but against something completely different. There used to be a distinction between high quality content and low quality content. And high quality content uh, or entertainment would always win because nobody in their good conscience would want to watch a stranger talking into their camera uh, in a poorly lit room for an hour. Um, but that changes if the person is your friend or your sister or a leading expert in a subculture you're into. So I had this illustrated here on this sliding scale of production value versus personalization. The more personalized something is, the less production value it needs. Uh, a single emoji is to the lowest possible production value possible, but, but if it's from a girl you like or a guy you like, uh, it's extremely engaging. Uh, and the less personalized something is, the higher production value it needs to be. Uh, the movie Avatar was not made for you specifically, but you want to see the spectacle, so, so you'll watch it. Uh, something in the middle would be like the fishing channel on TV or, or a YouTube star you're into. Uh, being entertained is becoming more binary. Either you're, you're entertained or you're not. And uh, in the platform age, social media has enabled personalization and specialization at scale. So you can flip a switch anywhere, anytime, and decide to entertain yourself. So what happens to advertising? Well, that's the $600 billion question everybody's trying to figure out right now. Uh, but for some perspective on, that, on the present state of digital advertising, let's go back to the beginning. This was the first banner ad. It debuted on October 27th, 1994. It was on Wired Magazine's website. It had a 41% click-through rate, which if you know anything about digital advertising now is insane. Uh, click-through rates now are like one-tenth of 1% 1 if you're lucky. Um, so what's different between now and then to make that difference? Well, novelty for sure. People had never seen this before. They wanted to click on it. But also there was scarcity and there, there weren't many web pages. So a lot of people would go to this page and a lot of people would, would click on it. Um, so now, what happens to ad-supported media in a world of no scarcity? Uh, well, I think two things. One, you'll have big media brands, uh, say like Vice or, or BuzzFeed, uh, that will do big deals with direct advertisers. They'll do it, they'll do deal, like Toyota will do a deal directly uh, with Vice. Uh, but small publishers will use programmatic ads. That could be ad networks, uh, Facebook instant articles, uh, YouTube ads, uh, ads on their own, uh, network ads on their own site. And this leaves a little, this leaves a, like a dangerous middle ground for publishers. Because if you're not a huge publishing brand, 
uh, but you have any significant overhead, you're going to go out of business if you rely solely on advertising. Uh, because the advertising dollars are either going to go to a, a big media brand or to a platform like Google or Facebook. Uh, furthermore, in the, in the platform age, I believe that ads and editorial will become increasingly unbundled. Um, in the future, ad sales may not be controlled by the same company at all who made the content like it has been traditionally. So why is that? Well, if you think about it, it's odd that the same people who made Friends also sold the ads around it. But it's just kind of a, a byproduct of how uh, airwaves worked and how the spectrum was sold. Um, and that's, yeah, that's just kind of the way it was. And same with the web. People, uh, people who made websites also controlled the ad space and they sold, uh, they sold the ads on them. But I think because of the move to platforms, there really is no longer a need for the same company who made the content to also be the one selling the ads around it. Uh, ESPN, for example, uh, might make great content, and then they'll put it on Facebook, and Facebook will sell the ads around it. And it makes sense that Facebook would, because Facebook has all that first-party data on, who use, on who's using Facebook, who has been interested in checking out a car over the past six months. They have better data than ESPN does, so why wouldn't they sell the ads? ESPN can make more money putting their stuff uh, on Facebook. Uh, and this is good for content creators to concentrate on what they do best, which is make content, uh, while knowing that their work will be seen by a lot of people because it's on a platform. Uh, question five, what happens to TV? Well, this is what a modern cable TV package looks like. It's like a bundle of content brands. Uh, these are American examples, obviously, but it's a bundle of content brands and genres that, that you're interested in, that you pay a little money each for. It comes in a bundle, and uh, you pay the bill each month. Uh, in the future, I actually think, I, I think we could see something very similar. A bundle of content brands, big and small, only this time personalized a little more to your taste than a generic cable bundle. And that's why I think the current players in, t in cable and TV are actually well positioned to succeed if they don't blow it because they already have something similar to what, the, what a future bundle would look like and, and they control internet going into your home, which, which certainly helps. Uh, that said, I think that there will be a few changes to TV going forward because of the digital age. Um, I think more networks, especially those without any live programming like news or sports, uh, will become ad-free, uh, and they'll exist more on paid subscriptions. And I think if people are DVRing and, and skipping through commercials anyway, uh, you know, why, why would the ads still be there? I think interfaces will get better. Uh, your cable TV provider will have to start competing with, uh, with Netflix, and that will, uh, you know, if Netflix is so easy to use, they'll say, we have to up our game too. And I also think there will be fewer shows per media brand. Uh, this could come as the byproduct of a result of not having to program a 24-hour day. You could just, uh, if, if you're a, let's say you're HBO, all you need is like three can't miss shows, and people want to subscribe uh, to your channel. So question number six, uh, what happens to quality journalism? Uh, this is something that you hear all the time now in the age of uh, clickbait and, uh, and listicles. So to answer this, uh, I think you look at how things used to be. So traditionally, fun, con fun content has subsidized serious content. And this was possible because the two were bundled together and because the people who owned it felt a responsibility to have a balance of both. Uh, in the US, you had kind of the, the Today Show, the, set, the cooking segment on Today Show subsidized the political stuff, Meet the Press, New York Times, and other magazines. You had crossword puzzles, subsidized uh, war coverage. But as those two things get split apart and serious work on its own doesn't generate enough revenue to justify the expense, what happens to it? Uh, what happens to those serious stories that, that need to be told, even though there's not a lot of money in it? Well, even if it's not lucrative, you know, I think we still need to know what's going on in the world. So there are two solutions I see to this. Um, the first are benefactors, basically rich people coming in and s feeling that they have a social responsibility to take over uh, uh, news publications. Jeff Bezos, CEO of Amazon, obviously uh, bought the Washington Post a couple years ago. Uh, Michael Bloomberg bought Business Week. It's been rumored that he's been wanting to buy the New York Times for a while. Um, so that, that's, that's one way it could happen. But the other way it could happen is that 
is the kind of like that, that old cross subsidization uh, between the serious and the, uh, the, the fun comes back in a different form. So if you look at what BuzzFeed's been doing lately, BuzzFeed still has the fun listicles and stuff, but it also has serious coverage. Now, there's no way that this very exhaustive report by BuzzFeed is generating any revenue to justify its expense. However, the benefit that BuzzFeed gets is that when they talk to advertisers, they can be seen as higher quality. This kind of puts like a shiny gloss on the brand, and they think, okay, BuzzFeed does important things. We, we want our brand associated uh, with BuzzFeed. And hopefully we can see more of this emerge. Uh, so the, the final question, how can a media company survive and thrive in the platform age? Um, well, the good news is that I think there's no better time than right now to start a content business if you do it right. And that doesn't mean it's the best time to sustain one, uh, but the gatekeepers aren't there to prevent you from starting it like they were in the past. Uh, new platforms and techniques are constantly emerging that become land grabs. With, with College Humor, we have close to 11 million subscribers on, on, er, on YouTube. And the reason we were able to do that, part, part of it was I think we make great content, but also we got in very early. And platforms seem to be rich get richer kind of environments where if you, if you start out early, you front load your effort, you can usually end up later with a lot more uh, engagement, a lot more followers. Um, Facebook Live could be that right now. Snapchat could be that. I think there are a lot of places where that are still land grabs, even as popular as they seem to be. So I think the key in the platform age is to build your publication for the world we live in today. Uh, so think of, the media, think of media as analogous to uh, the restaurant business. Consumers used to go to your restaurant and eat a full meal start to finish. That was the direct era. Then they would find you online, and you would be the, the one and the only one to bring them their food. That was the referral era. But now, it's like a food festival, and you're one of countless vendors all vying for the consumer's attention. And if you win, you can win big. You know, if you've ever been to a food festival, the best food at the festival always has the longest line. Um, on ad-supported digital media, uh, I'll give two, Im two important rules uh, that I think are, uh, are crucial. Rule number one, don't start a purely ad-supported digital media business. Uh, rule two, if you're tempted to start an ad-supported digital media business, see rule one. Um, I think what we've learned now is that just because you have an audience uh, doesn't mean you'll make enough money on advertising to support uh, and sustain a business. And that's not to say all internet businesses with an advertising component are bad. It just means that has to be part of a lar larger strategy. So if you think about... Uh, a content business, I think the best way to, to conceptualize it is, is like a funnel. Um, the ad-supported component is the top of the funnel, right? You can, it's, you can run it at break-even or maybe even uh, as a loss leader to get other people in. Uh, commerce is lower in the funnel. The Chive makes a great deal of money on t-shirts and beer, and the advertising is almost incidental to their, to their business. Um, subscription I believe is the, the holy grail of, of digital content. Uh, Crunchyroll does uh, is an anime subscription business. You may have heard of it. It does very well, 750,000 subs, paying like five bucks a month. And, uh, and it's all, and they, they've, they've built a community around anime. If you, you want to produce high quality content and you don't have a subscription model, it's almost like you have to start a Kickstarter for every new piece of content you want to make. Um, and the bottom two layers of the funnel, commerce and subscription, become easier to do the more specialized you are in, in what you're covering. Um, as we saw before when I was talking about homogenization of content, there are no advantages in publishing the same generic news that everybody else is. Um, here are some specialization success stories. Um, Skiff is a, a travel site. It's very narrow in its foc focus. It's for like travel industry professionals. It it does very well with, with conferences. Uh, Jessica Lesson started a tech uh, site, a tech newsletter called The Information, and people pay $40 a month to, to have access to this tech news. And that's, I think, uh, another lesson from The Information is that if people can write off your content as a business expense, it, it will make a lot of money because people don't mind doing that at all. Rooster Teeth, you may have heard of, uh, is kind of geek culture. They do events, subscription, commerce, and a little bit of advertising as well. 
Um, another source of revenue when you've established yourself as a leader in a category is selling expertise. Uh, so we have a, a, a brand called Dorkly, and it's all about fan culture. Um, and what we did with Coca-Cola was Coca-Cola was starting uh, an esports uh, social outreach, like a social effort, uh, but but they were Coke, and they didn't really know much about esports uh, because they're more focused on, on making beverages. So they came to Dorkley, and they said, hey, why don't you guys end up using your expertise and produce social content for us, and we'll distribute it. And that's what happened, and it was a big success. The Coke esports Twitter handle became the second most popular Twitter handle in all of Coca-Cola, right behind Coke Red. Um, so a, a, a media, this is something a media company can do that an ad agency can't because an ad agency can't like, afford to have like, a staff of writers specializing in every subject uh, on earth. Um, so expertise in a genre is becoming increasingly valuable to advertisers because in the platform age, it's too risky to have non-experts commenting on subjects of intense passion for their customers. And the importance of this hit me uh, a few months ago, and I call it the Red Lobster problem. Uh, Red Lobster, for those of you who don't know, is a seafood chain. It's based in the U.S., but they have locations uh, worldwide. Uh, the next part of this will sound like a, a non sequitur, but it's actually not. Um, in February, Beyonce released a new song called Formation, uh, in which she referred in the lyrics to Red Lobster. The company responded eight hours later with a pretty innocuous tweet, as you can see here. And what happened after that? Outrage. People were absolutely furious. And you're probably thinking, well, what were they furious about? And they basically were saying, you had eight hours, Red Lobster, to come up with the perfect response to Beyonce, and this was the best you could do, which sounds insane. But it shows how if you are a brand playing in the platform age, you're now expected uh, to, be c to be an expert on things. Uh, so this is Ken Lopdrop, who's the CEO of Red Lobster. If you would have told him a few years ago, if you would have said, hey, Ken, just so you know, you're gonna have to <laughs> your corporation will have to have the perfect response to a Beyonce lyric ready instantaneously, he, he would look at you like you were crazy. Uh, but things are, things are different in the platform age, and, and when you're called on, you need to be ready uh, with a response. And... Um, yeah, that's that's my presentation. Thank you. So yeah, any questions? I'm trying to get the mic. It's out somewhere here. Ah, there it is. Cool. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much, Ricky, for your entertaining yeah, yeah. talk. Um, and you talk about starting in the platform age and that you have to look at it as a restaurant. Yeah. So. But what if you are starting and these people want to start a blog or, or grow something mm. content-wise on the internet? Where do you start and how do you stand yeah, out? Yeah, so I mean, I think the key is to find something. First of all, I would publish directly to platforms like Facebook or Google AMP, th which is like their, their articles thing, uh, or, or YouTube. But I think the key is starting with something very, very narrow. Uh, so let's say you let's say instead of opposed to starting like a video game uh, publication, start a video game publication that's just about one genre or one game in particular, and then grow out from there. Because if you try to cover everything, there's too much competition. You're gonna try it's boiling the ocean. It's never gonna work. Uh, so so I think it's like on platform and and s with specificity are the keys. Okay, do we have someone? Yeah, Adrian in the front. So something you didn't really mention was, uh, because so I'm in the game industry, and what I see happen a lot these days is that the influence of media, uh -huh. uh, and, and specifically journalists, is actually nihil when it comes to like actual sales and revenue from that. Uh -huh. So if you make a game, and a, and a journalist writes about it, I will probably see like maybe 10 extra sales that yeah, day. Yeah. So it's kind, of, it's, si it's kind of sad. But on the other, s on the other hand is the the content creators on YouTube or Twitch, that if they talk about your game, you can see uh, easily like tens of thousands of extra downloads. Yeah. And you haven't really spoken about that, so how do you look at like the, um, the role of journalists within, b uh, basically journalists relative to actual like people like us just talking about yeah. stuff on the yeah. internet? Yeah, I mean, I, I, think the, the I think you're absolutely right. Media has like, if, you th if, I, was if I had a product and I had the choice of like having a hundred of the most like influential people on Instagram kind of use it, 
or get a big piece on the cover of Time magazine or whatever, I would choose the, the Instagram followers because it's more of a direct personal connection. I think what the primary role of like mainstream media now is almost like validation, right? Like people want to, f to feel like you're a real thing, they need the stamp of approval. And, and people I know in the commerce industry, it actually, like when you A-B test people and their checkout flow, having like logos of publications that you've been featured on, people are like, okay, this is real, I'm gonna buy it. Otherwise, they, they feel like it's, like it's not an official thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the power of, of like direct influence, Twitch, Twitch exact, uh, exactly, is much more than like one journalist's opinion, for sure. Other questions from the audience? Yes, this gentleman over here. <coughs> yeah, um, thanks, Ricky, for this um, really cool talk. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah uh, thanks for bringing up the influencers as well, because that's what my PhD is on. Uh, I on studies influencers? Yeah, social oh, cool. influence online. Um, so I was wondering, um, one trend we, have, we continue to see is that uh, trust is gradually eroding in these influencers, particularly on Instagram, because um, people start to lose their genuinity or their authenticity when uh, they start pro act aggressively promoting uh, products. Yeah. So how do you react to that? And can we still you know, hold up to this idea of engineering virality in the, in the platform age you've been describing today? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll tackle the first thing, the, the second thing first. I think engineering virality, it's, it's kind of impossible. Uh, and you know, we get advertisers that come to us all the time and they're like, we want a viral video. <laughs> and it's like going to a movie studio and saying like, it's like a movie studio saying, we want a hit movie. And it's like, all right, like, you know, everyone does. Uh, I, but I think one thing you can do to, to at least give a piece of content a chance to be viral is when you make it, think about like, ask yourself honestly, why would somebody share this? Because if there's no good reason somebody would share this, it's not, that's the only way things go viral. So people will share it to like, like I mentioned up here, like to pr show a political opinion or to say like, I'm the first one to, to, to see this or, or to like impress their friends or make them, like there has to be some reason. So cats, yeah, so right, <laughs> cats. So I think that, that's, that's on the engineering virality thing. And on the, the authenticity of influencers, I really think it, it almost comes down to like, how much are you promoting, right? Like if you are doing a different product every day, like even if you, even if you show passion about it, people are gonna be like, how many things can this influencer really be passionate about? So I think it's those influencers that like, that are, are very uh, selective with who they promote or what products they promote that, that benefit. But yeah, I mean, I, I know people who follow like Instagram accounts are like, oh, I'm unfollowing this person because it's, this is like every day, it's some new like, especially if it's a cheap thing, like a diet pill or something, you know? So maybe just to follow up, could you maybe share some uh, stories or some hacks in the early days of college humor? Yeah. How you managed to, you know, you know convince people to share these videos and Yeah, so, so uh, very early days of college humor, it was actually, you remember AOL Instant Messenger? Mm. It, was <laughs> it was that that, uh, that really drove sharing, like, because all college kids were using that. So people would put something in their away message or in their profile if they were featured on the site and then other people would go to it. We did no marketing, except like we put some uh, flyers over like bathroom stalls, but like besides that, um, it was really just like use like the only social media that exists, which is AIM. <laughs> wow. Any other questions from the audience? Then um, cool. I have uh, one closing one on okay. your comment that the internet kind of sucks right uh -huh. now. Basically, we are the internet. We post, internet we share, too. we block. You're the internet. Yeah, yeah. So how can we, as an audience, make sure it sucks a little less? I guess not getting <laughs> into so many fights. <laughs> like, I don't know. Wha the, the, the context of that was like I wrote this essay about like things that people debate at, at, at dinner parties, like people in media. And one of them was like, with all the like vitriol, like you go on, like if you go on Twitter now and you look at a, a, like a hashtag that has to do with politics, it's just like it's just like walking into a room where every single person is yelling at each other and nobody's listening. So I, th I think just like maybe be a little more open and accepting. And I, I'm trying to do that myself. So <laughs> I, I think that would be my answer, even though it's like a little utopian. Like that would yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> and world peace. And, okay. and world peace too. <laughs> thank you, Ricky, Great. very Thanks. much. Thanks for uh, coming. Thank you, audience. <laughs>